much for watching or listening. Liam Hartree here with another episode of Presenting Champions. And today I've got a very, very special guest who I've uh, been excited to interview for a long time. Very blessed to hear from this man today, Travis View, absolute legend of MMA. Uh, over 100 professional fights in MMA, UFC veteran, Bellator veteran, being in there with some of the best names you can be in there with in the cage, 39 knockouts, not many submissions, uh, also competes extensively in wrestling as well, is the Snake Pit USA heavyweight uh, catch, catch wrestling world champion, some twisted for you, um, folk style national champion as well, uh, has been around and done just about everything you can do in combat sports. So truly honoured to have this man on the show today and before we get into anything else champ, like I said before, big thank you for coming on, big thank you for making the time for this. Yeah, you bet, thank you. No problem, no problem. Hopefully I've, uh, hopefully I've done that justice with the intro because you've, you've been around, you've done so much, it's, uh, it's amazing. But getting into it um, first and foremost, I think with starting with the present day and then working sort of backwards sure. a little. You were recently um, booked to fight Josh Burns and transition over to bare knuckle boxing um, and sort of moving to that, obviously that sport's making waves all over the world. What is currently the situation uh, with that fight, but not only with that fight, with your move into bare knuckle boxing as a sport? Um, I've kind of been looking at bare knuckle boxing for a while since uh, BKFC kind of came into existence. Um, I remember talking to David Feldman, who, who's the owner of BKFC. Um, this was like in 2018. It was before his first show asking me if I'd be interested. And I, and I was, I, I think, uh, you know, I'm excited. I was excited to try it and excited to do it. Um, I had the opportunity to fight Josh Barnes for the super heavyweight title back in March of this year. And there were some medical issues. Um, I wasn't able to get my medicals done in time. I, we took the fight on short notice. Um, and it was in Florida, the state of Florida, and it, they require a lot of med, a lot of medicals to get done. And, uh, we just didn't have the time to get them done. Um, so I'm still looking to, to, to do bare knuckle boxing. Um, just haven't had the opportunity yet. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. It's good to, to clarify that a little bit. I think, um, a lot of people would love to see you, um, in the ring with bare knuckle boxing. So. Hopefully that will happen soon. Looking back over your MMA career, your wrestling career, there, there's a lot to talk about with uh, with so many different fights. But one of the things that amazes me is is the level of discipline that it must take to continue competing at the highest level for as many years as you have. I think it's 21 years um, with MMA, if I'm not mistaken, which is you know an extraordinary feat in itself. So talk us through a little bit about your training regime. But just specifically, you know, of how you've maintained um, fighting at the level and competing at the level you do for so many years, basically, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, I grew up wrestling. I wrestled all throughout high school and college. Um, so the, the training is, is something, is something I, I grew up with. Um, and it, for me now, as, as I've gotten older, it's, it's, it's just an everyday thing. I, I enjoy working out. I still do. You know, that's one of the reasons I, I still continue to fight and compete is I still enjoy the training. Um, it's obviously changed as I've gotten older. I'm not able to do the, the things I was, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, but, uh, you know, I, I still feel really good. I, I still train really hard. Um, there's a few things that have changed, but you know, I, I, I still, still feel pretty good. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I'm a big believer that age is, is just a number at the end of the day. Yeah. But what amazes me about it is um, just, as I say, the level of dedication. Because I read an interview you gave me probably 10 years ago now before a Bellator fight where you were talking about training sort of three or four times a day, I think it was, and you were you know, walking through your routine. And um, and it's just amazing, you know, that consistency over, over a number of years. It's not even a question, it's just me saying um 21 years i mean what what an achievement and counting so uh so fantastic okay the other thing obviously that i i like to get into sometimes with fighters which i think is often overlooked is the mental side of competition because as much as it, it you know it's a very very physical thing again to consistently do what you do uh, over 100 professional fights everything i listed out just now 
it takes a strong mindset as well so let's talk a little bit about how you mentally approach competition but also how that may have changed um over your career as well and over your level of experience i mean it it the the mental part is probably tougher than the physical part to be honest with you like i said i enjoy the training the mental part um it, it kind of goes hand in hand with the, with the physical part if, if you're trained if i'm if i'm physically ready to fight i'm in a pretty good mental state i feel pretty good and i feel confident um there's been fights i've taken in the past or for one reason or another I, I haven't been able to train properly and yeah my mental state is definitely different so i think the two go hand in hand you you can't have one without the other you if you if you're in shape and, and you've trained hard leading up to the fight there's no reason why you shouldn't be mentally ready to go um so i think i think you can't have one without the other i like that this is um it's a wise answer and it's also useful for you know this new generation coming through as well because yeah. I really, you know one of the things that we'll get into a bit today is is some of the sort of tips and, and techniques that you've got having done this for as long as you have for like a lot of these you know brand new guys coming through yep. with Sam professional um we can pass on some knowledge to them watching and listening around the world so that'll definitely be a feature today just so you uh, just so you know mm -hmm. stuff okay now you mentioned earlier before we sort of delve into the past a little bit more um one more thing about the future obviously you mentioned about bare knuckle boxing but are you thinking of sort of toggling between bare knuckle boxing and MMA as well, or are you feeling not, uh, you know more that you're going to focus more exclusively on the, you know, the bare knuckle side of things um, in that that way? That was just something I meant to ask at the beginning in terms of your, you know, your future plans and what people can expect, keeping an eye out from your fights going forward, basically. I mean, I, I definitely want to try try bare knuckle boxing. I I think. Uh... Yeah, I consider myself a pretty tough guy and there's no, I mean, having a hundred MMA fights kind of puts me in that category of being a tough guy, but I think maybe bare knuckle boxing even, you know, takes that to a different level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one of the, I'm, I, I enjoy challenges. I, I would like to challenge. Um, so I want to see how it goes. I want to see, I, I think I can do pretty well in it. Uh, I've watched a lot of it. I've, I've, uh, you know, I think I could do pretty well in it. So I, I definitely like to give it a shot and, and, you know, see where it goes. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're all, we're all excited for that. Um, very much, you know, I just wanted to, uh, get into that a little bit more with, you know, with, with MMA as well, but looking back over your, um, your career, I mean, it, as I mentioned at the beginning, it, it is extraordinary. Um, everything you've accomplished. As I mentioned, 39 knockouts. I think it's um, 78 wins, 22 losses, if I'm not mistaken. I think there's a no contest in there somewhere. Um, yep. But do that. So it's, it's an amazing achievement. I know you've, you've still got um, a pretty few fights left in you by the sound of it. Looking back, though, on all of that, do you have particular fights that stand out to you that you're the most proud of? I'm aware when I ask this question, it's quite a big question because obviously. Mm -hmm. Looking back over so many years and so many patients, um, so many people, etc., and, and and so forth. But still, in, in your own mind, are there is there one or maybe more than one that stand out? You look back and you sort of think, you know, that was that was the one I'm I'm really proud of that achievement. Yeah, there's there's a few of them. I'd probably say the biggest one was um, knocking out uh, Kazuki Fujita. Um, it was my first fight in Japan, and at the time he was. Uh, I mean, he still is, he, you know, he's a, he's a Japanese legend in, in the MMA scene over there. Um, he, he had some huge wins over a lot of really good American fighters. Um, it was somebody I grew up watching and, uh, you know, first fight in Japan, it was at the Saitama Super Arena. Um, it was a packed house, you know, all the stories they say about the Japanese crowd are, you know, are true. They, they really, respect and, and look up to fighters and they treat fighters differently than than maybe over here in the states um and then to knock him out which you know nobody had knocked him out he, his his nickname was was ironhead and it, it was it was for a reason and uh to knock him out in in front of 
you know, it was a full house. There were 30, 40,000 people there. And um, I, I was probably the most shocked one in the crowd because I thought if I was going to ever beat them, it would probably be grinding out a decision using my wrestling. And, and then I was able to knock him out. So I would say definitely out of all my fights, that would probably the one that sticks out the most. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is amazing. I, I thought you might say that one um, as, as at least one of them, to be honest. But I love asking this question because you know you, you don't always get the answer that you'd expect. Um, so I mean, sometimes with with champions, you know, you think it's going to be their world title win or one of their the big fights, and it's, it's something completely different. So it's uh, but yeah, that was an amazing achievement. I've seen that fight. Anyone watching who hasn't seen that fight, go check it out. It's on YouTube. It, it, it really is an amazing, absolutely amazing performance. So um, you mentioned there also about the, the Japanese um, crowd, and, and I've heard that from a few fighters that they are very um, knowledgeable, very respectful of martial arts. They, you know, they have a very deep understanding. Um, you have fought all over the world. You know, it, it, I mean, I was uh, I knew it was quite a few locations, but when I was researching for this and just getting ready, it was more again. I was just thinking, wow, you know, this man is is a globe trotter. He's been he's been everywhere. So. In terms of that, in terms of welcomes from the crowd, you know, atmosphere um, that people create. Obviously, you fought all over the U.S. You fought Japan. There, there's Brazil. There's so many different places I, I was looking at. Do you have a like a favorite in terms of the welcome that you received or the atmosphere that was created? In a, again, it might be more than one, um, but in your own words, on that one, please. Uh, it, it probably Japan, uh, just because, you know, like I said, the, the fans, I, I always say that the fans over there treat, um, fighters kind of like we in the United States treat, um, football players that play in the NFL. Um, there's, they're, they're looked up to that much and they're, they're given that much respect. Um, so that was very cool. Um, I fought in Abu Dhabi about, it was just a few years ago, probably four or five years ago. Um, and, and that place was, was like no other I had been before. Um, the crowd was very respectful. Um, but just the, the, you know, the, the environment and, and, um, the, the settings in the arena were, were pretty amazing. Um, you know, I, I've, I've, I have got to uh, fight a lot of places, and I haven't ran into too many crowds that, that weren't very welcoming. Um, th there's been a few, but for the most part, um, most fans, I would say, treat fighters pretty respectfully. Mm. Yeah, I've seen that as well. Um, I've seen that as well, but it's, it's also good to get into it because um, I think mostly, again, because of the length of time that you fought as well. So as well as the locations, you know, you've got um, competing in different eras as well when sort of the understanding of what MMA is has sort of evolved and, and developed. So that way, you know, you may have had different, um, different experiences with that as well, which does lead me to something that I was going to get into a little bit later on, but we'll get into it now. It, it is that evolution, you know, because you've been around the sport for such a long time, Going back 20 years ago, it was totally different. And I've heard this from people like I had, um, for example, I had Shannon Rich on this show, you know, who was, who was competing, um, well, before MMA was even fully legal, you know, and he, he talked a bit about the evolution. You've probably had a similar type of experience where, you know, you've seen the sport go from quite a niche uh, type of thing to obviously multi billion dollar industry, fans all over the world, etc., etc. It sounds sort of obvious, but I still would like to get your thoughts on this, on some of the evolution that you've seen, whether it's good points, whether it's bad points. I know some of these questions I'm asking are quite broad, um, but I was sure. doing that. I was thinking, well, you know, I, could, I, I was thinking you've had too many facts to talk about them all and, and everything. Yeah. So I was thinking instead, let's let's get your thoughts on some, some bigger topics, um, which, is, which is why I've chosen that. But I know this is a very, very big question, and it's probably more than we can get into in, in, sort of in one go. But just a few things that do stand out to you that you've seen over that time, maybe that you like, maybe that you don't like. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? The, the sport's really not even the same. Um, when I first started, it, it wasn't even called mixed martial arts back then. I, I think it was called NHB or No Holds Barred. Um, I think in 
most ways it's probably a good thing um, it, that it's changed. Um, I can see some bad things also. I think ath athletic commissions, um, especially here in the United States, take a lot of money, um, which I think athletic commissions make the sport safer. So overall it's good, but they take such a large amount of money that I think it's hard for promotions to make any money, which it's kind of a trickle down effect. And then it's hard for fighters to make money and it's just hard for anybody to make money. I remember probably this is about 10 years ago. Um, there just wasn't as many athletic commissions around and I was fighting all the time. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I probably have a hundred fights is because there weren't as many athletic commissions around. So it was easier for me to get fights. Um, you know, the, the promotions were making more money and, and they could pay me more money. And so I think athletic commissions are kind of taking, they're taking so much money that it's, it's hard for, um, especially smaller promotions to do anything. Um, that, and that's how I got a lot of fights early on in my career is I would take smaller fights and smaller promotions and, and get three or four wins. And then a bigger promotion would call and, and, and I do get a, uh, you know, I'd get the opportunity to fight in a big show. Um, so I think that's the biggest change, you know, the, there's always new techniques and things like that, but the, the biggest thing I see is um, athletic commissions, which, like I said, I think it's a good thing because they're making the sport safer, but it, it's just harder for, for fighters to make money. Yeah, that's a, that's a good insight. That is a good, um, that's a good insight because I could see a few different angles that it, it might go down with, with your thoughts on that, but... Um, it makes a lot of sense, and again, you know, given given the many years you've been involved, you you know, you've seen these changes in a way that um, very few people have, in all fairness, which which I think is is very cool. Um, I mean that as a compliment because you know, you've seen the sport come out of the dark ages. One of the things that does interest me, though, going back to those early early days of MMA, is I can understand sort of how you would get into it as a progression from wrestling and, and things like that. That's that that's fairly common. But at the same time, obviously it was very niche then. Now, these days, somebody gets into MMA, you know, kids grow up, they dream of being a UFC champion, Bellator champion, whatever. It wasn't like that back then. It was probably quite niche. People were probably thinking, well, you know, what are you doing? Yeah. So, into sort of a, like your early motivations, uh, and again, maybe this has changed over the years, but back then, getting into quite a, a niche sport at the time, what was your mindset like? back in those days of your motivation to actually want to do it, to actually want to compete? So, like I said, I, I wrestled um, all throughout high school and then I wrestled in college. Um, yeah, and back then, the, the sport's nothing like it is now. And I mean, nobody, I shouldn't say nobody, but it, a lot of people didn't know about it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I wanted to continue to do something active. I wanted to, you know, I just, I've lifted a weight, uh, I've lifted weights, you know, since I was, 15 years old, 16 years old. I've always been an active kid and, and into, you know, doing physical things. And then when you graduate college or when you're done with college, there, there's really not much out there, you know? So I, I didn't want to just, um, you know, not be physically active. And, uh, I, I had the opportunity, um, to, to do a fight. It was, it was a small one, very small, uh, in my, my hometown where I grew up. And, uh, at the time I'd never been into a fight in my life. I'd never thrown a punch or gotten punched. Um, but like I said, I just got done wrestling and I was a pretty big, strong guy and I wanted to do something. So it was, it was an opportunity that I took. And, um, you know, since, since then the, the sport, you know, like we've talked about, it's changed. Um, but it, uh, it, it, it's definitely something that that that's changed over time. My motivation has changed over time, and and um, but back then when I started, you know, I, I just wanted to do something active, and back then I, it was doing it for fun. You know, I wasn't getting paid a lot of money those first few fights, those first few years, but it, it was fun. It was something to stay busy, and you know, it, yeah, people thought I was crazy, but. Uh, you know, I, I did well in wrestling and, and back then that's all you really had to do is be a good wrestler and, and 
you know, you, you could, you could win most fights. Obviously now that's changed, but back when I started, all you had to be was a good wrestler. Yeah. Yeah. I have heard that as well. It's, um, it's a very cool story about, you know, being, um, wanting to be physically active and it, it you know, it's, it's almost a little bit low key compared to everything you've gone on to achieve. Um, and, and if you get what I mean, but it's, I can totally get my head around, uh, around that motivation, uh, 110%. But obviously coming from a wrestling background, um, and being a very, very skilled wrestler and, and a world champion uh, in that, as I've mentioned, um, and all the rest of it, you do have a very high knockout count. Um, in fact, you're actually listed on um, some of the highest um, MMA knockout lists and, and what have you. I'm sure you're aware of that, but for any fans that are not, you, you know, Travis is listed there. Um, in terms of that, did you expect early on in your career to be basically such a such a heavy hitter, you know, such a such a powerful individual with your hands? Um, because that seems a little bit of a transition, obviously, from I know your wrestling is still very strong and, and you've got some great submissions as well, which we'll get to. But yeah, I mean, the, the hands, was that something that you expected to happen in, you know, in those early days? Early on, definitely no. You know, I'd, I'd never taken a boxing class. I wasn't really a big fan of boxing, you know, back then. Um, as, as the sport's gotten bigger and I got to bigger, do bigger fights and uh, I was involved more. Yeah, I had to learn how to box and defend myself and, and throw punches and, and, and learn the art of boxing, which I, I have so much respect for. I think it's, it's way tougher to teach somebody how to box than it is how to wrestle. Um, but, you know, I'm a big guy, and uh, I would say most, almost all big guys hit pretty hard, you know. So it, it, it kind of uh, – it kind of goes with the territory, you know, most, most big guys have heavy hands. True. True. I mean, yeah, I can understand how you put it down to, um, sort of natural size and, and, you know, bulk and all that sort of thing. It makes sense. It's still, um, it's a humble answer. I, you know, considering what you've achieved with, um, with your hands as well, but I, I do get where you're coming from with that. Um, very much. I mean, again, I, I work a lot with pro boxing. You do see that with a lot of heavyweights, super heavyweights. You, yeah. know, you, you can naturally punch whether they can learn you know, to channel that in the, in the correct way. It's, it's a different thing, but you often have the raw power there. So, um, yeah. you know, fair enough. You know, um, I can I can see where you're coming from. Obviously, one of the things I mentioned at the beginning was about um, advice for like um, fighters or athletes who are coming into the sport, and by the, by the sport, I mean, this can be for wrestling, this can be for martial arts, I don't mind. Part of the reason I like asking this question is, is a lot of champions um, share things that, you, when, you know, when I do these, that you can apply to life as well as to, to sports, you know. Um, so I, I often ask this because I think, you know, if I'm going to do a fight interview, yes, it's exciting to talk about the highs and the lows, but let's give it a little bit of value for you know, people who are coming through and, and who want to achieve something, people who look up to you um, and what you've accomplished and say, you know, I, I want to be like that. Um, very big question. I know it, it seems to be a theme of, uh, you know, this talk, but nonetheless, if you had to give advice for um, these young guns coming through anywhere around the world, whether it's over here in the UK, Europe, over in the US, doesn't matter, um, what would be a few tips that you, you know, you'd share with them um, that you regard to be essential to sort of succeed and, and to do well in a sporting career, an athletic career, that type of thing? Yeah, I, th I think it's it's a very tough sport to uh, to do really well in. I mean, guys it, guys see the, the really good fighters on TV um, and on pay-per-view, and I don't think – the average person realizes how talented that person is or how good that person is um, to be one of those top guys, to be a, a UFC champion. I mean, that that's like the elite of the elite. I think too many people get into sport thinking they're going to do that. And, and that, that person that, that that's on pay-per-view or on TV is, 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 is very special. I mean, that, that's like the top 1%. And I think too many people get into the sport thinking they're going to do that. And, and there's just not too many people around that, that are that talented. 
Um, and then, and then it's the hard work and the dedication and the discipline, all of that other stuff. I mean, it, it being around a few people like that, that, that have achieved that level. Um, I don't think people understand how tough that is. And, and too many people get in the sport thinking they're going to make a lot of money and, and gain a lot of fame. And it, it, it's, it's ridiculous how good those top guys are. So uh, anytime people ask me, you know, how they get into the sport or, or what they should do, the first thing I always tell them is, you know, go to school, go to college, get your education, get a good job. Um, and then if you still feel like training and fighting, you know, then, then look for a good school and, and a good trainer, but do all that other stuff first, because if, if you're just banking on, if you're just counting on you becoming a, a multi-million dollar UFC champion, those, those just don't happen too often. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good lesson there actually, uh, Again, you know, it's, it's sort of a distinction I've seen with um, the different eras of, of mixed martial arts where you do get a lot of people from your sort of generation or whatever you want to call that who yep. will fight for pure um, reasons. And what I mean by that is, you know, they had a very personal motivation um, to want to do it, which was strong. And whereas now you do get a lot of people who think I'm going to fight and, and hit the jackpot. And obviously, the, you know, it doesn't happen that way very often. Yeah, being... Um, I mean, obviously, I don't claim to be an athlete or anything like that, but even being in fight camps and being with people yeah. going through that process, it's just, it's a whole different lifestyle. And, you know, you have to be willing to give that 100% or not be there, you know, because of the risk. So there, there's a lot of things that you said there. Getting the education, totally agree with that. I mean, putting all your eggs in one basket is, is never a good idea. So there, there's a lot of, uh, lot of good advice there, actually, um, which I knew there would be. And um, it's... It's good sort of real down to earth advice as well, which I love. Um, so that's some uh, that's something. Moving on a tiny bit from it, though, going a little bit deeper into that before we move on. Say these people are, are out there, they get a you know they do the backup plan, they get an education, they get a degree, they get a preferably a skill or a trade, which is always good because you'll never be necessarily out of work with that, or at least not as easily, and so on and so forth. Say they still do want to do it, they make the decision saying okay. You know, I've thought about this, I know the risks, but I also know the rewards, and I have a strong motivation that I do want to compete. Uh, hopefully it's something more than just being famous, or hopefully it's just the love of training or whatever, but that's, that's down to each different person. From there, um, the steps that you would recommend, I mean, obviously finding a good gym and um, finding someone who has good knowledge, but in terms of what people have to do day to day, I mean, you're in a prime position to, to talk about this training three or four times a day, living, uh, you know, being very disciplined with diet, being very disciplined with everything that, that a top athlete has to do. Um, I think that you're, you know, and the reason I'm asking you this is there's diff there are different levels of discipline in the fight game, but you've always been 100% on that over the, you know, just 20 years. That that's, no, no one can ever question, you know, Travis didn't show up because of, you know, not training or whatever, even if other things didn't didn't always work. So at least that's my view anyway. So rambling question, I'm sorry, but in simple terms, say say they're a step on from what we were talking about with the backup plan. What would you advise from that point? I think it, it's huge that you have a wrestling background. Um, you know, I, I think the higher level wrestlers are, are going to take the sport over. I mean, which maybe they already have. You know. But I think the the better wrestling background you have, um, the 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 better you're going to do. Um, and then I think it's huge to find a good school, you know, and a, and a good trainer. If if you're training with a bunch of guys in your garage, and and you think you're going to be the UFC champion, it, it's probably not going to work out for you, you know. It, um, having a, a trainer, or a school, or a gym that that is producing those champions um i mean if, you, if you're really dedicated then you know you might have to move around and, and find a, a a pretty reputable gym obviously there's a lot of them around the united states um and around the world but yeah you you got to have a good gym you got to have good training partners um a good head trainer the guy that knows what he's doing a guy that knows people and that people know him um i mean you can be the hardest worker in the world but 
if you don't have um, a promoter or a trainer or a manager that's known in the sport and, and you're not going to get known, you know, like I said, you can be the hardest worker in the world, but if, if nobody knows you, you know, it, it's just unfortunate, but that's the way it is. There, there's plenty of fighters that are, are training in the right gym um, that get opportunities uh, because of the gym they're from, because of the guy they're training with, um, because of their training partners. Um, there, there's plenty of guys like that. And uh, I'd say that that's the next step. If you're really serious about this is, is you got to find the right gym. Um, you got to find the right trainer, the right training partners. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a powerful lesson. And, you know, first of all, I love the realism of, you know, where, where you're coming from because it's, it's very practical, it's very hands-on, which, is, which I thought it would be, but yeah, I mean, it, it sounds obvious, but the idea that success breeds success and, you know the people that you're around um it, it sort of um rubs off on you and you're only going to get better by sort of sparring or competing or training with people who have a higher levels than you and stretching and stuff i mean there was a post on your instagram the other day iron sharpens iron you know after yeah. uh, I guess a sparring session or something and you know it sounds like sort of a cheesy phrase but it's 100 percent true you yeah. know you support yourself with success and you will get better so that's you just to underpin that lesson anyone out there listening and like I said before, you know, that applies to life as well. That applies not just to combat sports or wrestling or, or whatever. You can apply that in anything else you want to be good at. You have to surround yourself with the best um, the best people. So it's, it, it's a very, very important life lesson there. Obviously, um, knowing the right people always helps people with connections and all that. Um, it's not what you know, it's who you know. There's an element of truth in that. But the success breeds success sort of idea, sort of concept is a really good yeah. Really good lesson. So I'm, I think people get some real value from that. Um, changing the subject back to um, sort of a little bit more the nitty gritty of some of the combat sports themselves. I've asked about your proudest moments with, with, in terms of mixed martial arts, but also you know you have some very big achievements in wrestling itself. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning with Snake Pit and with um, these different uh, these different things, folk style and what have you. So. Coming from that background and obviously the different competitions you've been in, etc. Basically the same question about your proudest achievements there, because I feel we should give that a mention because it, you know it's it's obviously a passion of yours, it's something you have a background, it's something that's by the sound of it always been there for you. Um, so do you have a proudest moment within the world of wrestling itself? Yeah, that probably just happened um, this year. I, I won the, the Greco-Roman national title um, for veterans. That was in Las Vegas. Um, that would have been like in April, so just a couple months ago. Um, it was a big deal just because uh, it, it qualified me for the, net, the world tournament, um, which I'm planning on doing. That's in October um, in Bulgaria. So... Um, it was a good, uh, good experience and, and something I wanted to do for a long time and, and took advantage of the situation. And I was able to win a national title. So that, that was, uh, that was a good, uh, good experience for me. Yeah. That's cool. That's fun. And congrats on that. Uh, that accomplishment it is an amazing accomplishment. And I just wanted to give that a mention because I thought, um, you know, you, you've accomplished a lot in wrestling as well. Um, and again, you know, I knew sort of bits and pieces about that, but researching this, you realize how, just how much actually. So, um, so it's, it's good to, to give, that, um, give that a mention. So again, I know, as I've, as I've repeatedly said now, broader questions are, are the theme of, uh, of the day today. As I was thinking, I, I want to do this a little different um, when people walk through fight by fight. You've heard one, sometimes you've heard them all, so I thought I'll get your point of view on a few different subjects. Going back to the, the nitty gritty of fights, though, there, there are things that people want to know um, that come up in pretty much every interview I do. Things like hardest hitters, you know, who had the fastest hands, who had this, who had that. So, get into a couple of things. We'll get into a couple of things um, like that in in a moment. Um, I think is is one and one that comes up in every interview I do, whether it's bare knuckle boxing, gloves, you know, professional boxing, MMA, kickboxing, whatever it is, I, I have them all on here. Um, unless it's obviously wrestling or jiu-jitsu, anything striking, people always want to know hardest hitters and you know all that sort of thing. 
So, um, out of 100 fights and, and all the rest of it that you've had, in terms of the striking aspect, you hit pretty hard. You said earlier about being a big guy, big guys hit hard. You were in there with a fair few of them as well. It, who stands out as being um, the hardest striker that you were you were in the cage with? Um, so it would have been, uh, I think it was my last fight in Bellator. Um, so I'd probably been like 2017. I fought uh, Ryan Martinez was his name. Um, big, big, strong heavyweight. Uh, he was a southpaw, which I've, I've always struggled with southpaws. And uh, he hit me with, a, I guess it would have been a right hook. Um, or maybe it was a right straight, but that was probably the, the hardest I'd been hit, the, the, the worst I'd been knocked out. Um, that sticks out probably more than, than any other any other time I've been knocked out just because um, that was a pretty bad one. But I'd, I'd say out of all of them, that, that'd probably be the worst one. Uh, he was the hardest hitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. It does make sense. Again, as, as I mentioned, it's not, not always the answer you'd expect. I mean, because uh, I, I know that was, I've seen that fight on, um, I think that's what, after the fight on YouTube, but I have seen it. And yeah, it, it looked like a big shot, but you, don't, you can't always tell from the outside looking in necessarily that it was one of the biggest. So um, so that, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and in terms of um, who had, so actually, before we get into that, you, you sort of touched on a really good point there. Um, which I think would also be good to, to, to give people a little value. When it comes from sort of bouncing back from something like that, I mean, you know, we, we've talked about the, the high points. I'm quite a positive guy, so I like to talk about the high points of, of um, people's careers. And obviously, we've got the 78 wins and 39 knockouts. Uh, I think it's, it's a dozen teams or whatever, all of these different things. But there have been some sort of tough losses for you as well that you've had to bounce back from. You know, this did no reason to should be called that. So in terms of um, in terms of how you actually do bounce back and you have that resilience because it, it's another feature of your career is uh, being very very resilient to highs and lows. Um, certainly from you know when I'm sitting there's there's been quite a few of both. We've talked about some of the highs, talking about some of the lows. How do you come back from some of those um, you know those tough losses, especially if it's like a big knockout like that or something that's it's a lot of fighters' like, worst fear. You know this is getting basically put to sleep like that and, and whatever, no shame in it, but then nonetheless it is what people worry about a lot. How do you bounce back from that? I mean, that, that is the question really. Yeah, it's tough, you know, especially I, I put a lot into my training and I, I take a lot of pride in, in uh, you know, fighting and competing um, and taking a loss is, is tough. Uh, bouncing back for me, it's always been, um, wanting to get out there again as quickly as possible and, and get rid of that feeling. Um, yeah, obviously that's not always possible when, when you take a knockout, you have to, you know, um, usually the athletic commission will make you sit out 60, 90 days, sometimes even longer. Um, so for me, it's always getting, you know, bouncing right back and, and wanting to go out and compete again. Uh, so it, it's tough when when you put a lot of effort and, and time into training and, and things don't go well. Um, but for me, it's always just wanting to get right back out there. And sometimes you, you, you always can't. And that makes it even harder just having to sit there and, and look at the, you know, the, the what ifs or the, the might have been. So that's, that's the one way I've, I've always dealt with losing is, is, getting right back out there and wanting to compete again yeah again actually you know it, it's, it's a really good um it's a really good lesson for people because using that as as fuel if you like to um be better next time and to improve yourself is, is also something you can apply to different life areas as well uh obviously to, to um professional fighters and athletes watching this powerful lesson but powerful life lesson as well so um very very cool Going back with um, a couple of other things touching on earlier, because obviously we, we are coming to the, the latter part of this now um, as well. I want to give a, a mention to um, 
some of your submission wins as well because we talked about a lot of these big knockouts and um, obviously some that happened to you but many that you inflicted on other people with 39 of them uh, and all the rest of it but you also have some great submission wins um, in mixed martial arts you know there, there's a different variety of uh, different chokes and different uh, joint locks and different things that you've used so going back to the high points um, you know just touch on the low points there do you have a a favorite with those you know one that you feel is uh, or maybe more than one um that's really showcased your skill really um you know but your favorite submission basically that you hold off you know i don't really have a favorite submission um i'm very fortunate to train with uh his name is mario roberto um black belt in brazilian jiu-jitsu I've, I've trained with him i mean i probably started in like 2000 seven um and i was very fortunate to train with him for a long time and and he, he's probably the best guy i've ever worked with on the ground he he uh he, he taught me so much about you know we, we worked a lot of submissions but we worked a lot of submission defense as well and you know i was i was fighting a lot of a lot of brazilians um you know early on in my career and I would have never did as well as if is is I did um without training with Mario he we we worked a ton of submission defense and uh you know I I did have my fair share of submissions but submission defense is probably something I'm I'm even more proud of yeah that's that's a good answer um submission defense yeah I can I can totally get my head around that um you know, as I mentioned before, we're coming sort of to the, the latter part of this. So, um, as I'm, as I've mentioned, about an hour is what I'm aiming for. We'll be coming up on that soon. Um, so, the la moving into the last couple of things, there's so many different things I could ask about opponents and about uh, you know different different varieties of of different things. And I had on here, you know, um, fastest hands, and I had on here uh, all different different things, but. Bringing it together into a broader one, um, in terms of all the people you fought, their their skill set more broadly. Basically, who who would you say was the best that you faced um, overall? Because I was thinking about breaking this down and thinking, you know, starting with who had the best power and who had the best this. And in the nicest way, we'd be here all day because you've been in there with so many different guys and they've got so many different styles. And do you know what I mean? It's quite a mix and match. So I thought, okay, looking at it, looking at it more broadly, um, if you have to say the best, the best you faced again, it's possibly more than one guy. Um, and I know this is also could be the stand-up game or the ground game as well. So this could be in, in both directions. I don't mind uh, because you, you, you were the one who was in there at the end of the day, not me. So best you faced in your own words, who would be some of those people and why, please? I'd probably say the best was. Um, when I fought in U uh, UFC 52, I fought Renato um, Sobral or Babalu. Um, he was probably the best guy I felt like I was in there with. Just I felt, you know, obviously he's known for his ground game, um, but he had good hands and good kicks, good wrestling. Um, you know, I was able to do okay. I think he submitted me in the second round. Um, but I felt maybe that was the one guy I've, I've ever been in there with. That I felt like I was kind of all class. Um, and then the second time I fought in Japan, I fought um, King Mo, um, mm. Muhammad Lawal. Um, I'd known about him for a long time. He, he comes from a really good wrestling background. Um, and kind of the same thing. Um, kind of felt like I was all class. He, he's, he was just faster than me, good wrestler. Um, and then he was able to knock me out. So, um, and he and he went on to have a great career. Um, so I'd say those are the two guys that, you know, I, I, when I was in there, I can remember thinking like, you know, wow, well, these guys are pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, it is amazing. Again, you know, I thought that they, um, those guys might come up at some point, but again, with you having had so many, I, I wasn't sure. Um, but it's a very, very cool answer. And, you know, with that, we've, we've talked about the highs and the lows, and it gives people, hopefully, um, a very 
sort of grounded view of um, the fight game and of a, of a professional athlete's life in terms of the highs and the lows, you know, because you, you've had a lot of wins and I like to focus on that, but there are those fights that they don't go to plan and, you know, other things happen, you have to adapt in there and so on and so forth, you know better than I do. So it, hopefully it gives that side of it a mention um, as well. As I've said, moving into the, the last um, sort of 10 minutes or whatever it is of this, um, of this talk, um, we've talked about a lot of a lot of things and we've talked a little bit about the future um, and your um, future plans of going for boxing and so on and so forth. I know you've got some fights left in you, so I don't mean this, this question to sound grim in, in any way, but in terms of you know how you feel that you are remembered um, as a fighter, as an athlete, you know, in terms of your legacy, which I think is a very prestigious one, but obviously, again, um, this will have to be in your own words. Basically, what are your thoughts on, on that? I mean, in terms of um, how people remember you, how you'd like to be remembered as a fighter. I don't mean this to sound grim as I say that it's all over or whatever, because I know there's, there's more going on, but from the positive aspect, looking back on, on a, an absolutely incredible um, professional career that few people will ever rival, um, especially in this, this day and age where people have less fights and all the rest of it. What are your thoughts on that, on your fight legacy, basically? Yeah, I've thought a little bit about that as, as I've gotten older and, 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 you know, have fewer and fewer fights left. Um, I, I think the biggest thing I want to be remembered as is a tough guy, you know, like, you know, maybe not the most skilled, you know, not definitely not the best wrestler, not the best boxer, not the best jujitsu, but but just a really tough guy. And I think that's how I've won the majority of my fights. Is is you know good training, but you know I've always I've always been prepared. But just physically being a tough guy, I think that's that's one of the biggest compliments, in my opinion, is you can give somebody is you know that, that that's a tough guy right there. That, that's a pretty big uh, a pretty big compliment to me, and and I would think that that I, I qualify for that. And um, mm -hmm. I think that's probably my legacy is, is, you know, being considered a pretty tough guy. Yeah. It's a good answer. Um, and it's, I definitely think you're in safe hands with that one. I mean, I think, uh, honestly, you know, in terms of you're one of the toughest guys to, um, to compete in MMA, I think, and I'm not just saying that to be polite or, or anything. Um, anything like that, I really mean that. I mean, you know, when, when you look back at, uh, and when you look back more sort of technically and more in depth again than what we've gone into today, at the different types of guys you've been in there with and their styles and, you know, the background of some of the fights and all this stuff. Toughness, yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely, in the tough Hall of Fame, you know, it's absolutely a very, very safe legacy. And, um, it's good to get your views on that. So, Last question really um, is just to give a, a shout out to the fans because we've got we've talked about a bunch of stuff in here that's quite relevant to other professional athletes um, you know people can use in their day to day lives as well but at the end of the day the sport will be nothing without fans and when it comes down to those people around the world who've supported you um, over your the course of your career uh, again I'm focusing on the positive with this because uh, there's always uh, there's always haters, there's always negative people, but there's also always supporters and, and people who, um, whether it's paying to watch a fight, you know, on pay-per-view, attending a fight, or whether it's even just um, positive comments, positive messages on social media. Um, again, obviously social media has probably come much more into the, the forefront of, uh, you know, of the fight game since your time in, in that. But yeah, just, just to give a shout out to those people, what you would say to those people around the world who supported you, what your words would be for them, the support would be nothing without them. So I'd like to give them a mention, basically. Yeah, you know, I really appreciate it. it, it uh, the fans is, is what makes this sport really special. Is, is If it wasn't for the fans, it'd just be a, a couple guys, you know, fighting in a back alley. But it, it's the fans that make this sport really special. Um, and, and it, it still blows my mind. It's still really crazy to me that, that, uh, you know, people, you know, recognize me and, 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 and enjoy watching me fight and, and getting interviews like this, like, it's still pretty cool to me. You know, I've, I've been around a while and, and, and did some things and it's, it's still cool to, to do these interviews and talk about old things. And, and I really appreciate 
you know, the, the you know, you taking the time and the fans showing respect and, and, and it, it, it's still pretty cool to me, even after all this time. I love that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I love that, you know, that you're such a humble guy and, you know, you're quite, um, you're quite low key about your achievements. Um, it's, it's the way it should be, I think, but it's still really nice to see. Um, you're very welcome. I mean, from my, from my side, obviously, I can't speak for the fans everywhere, but giving them a shout out is, is wonderful um, because they're not appreciated enough, even though they, they are the wheels that make the sport go around. But from my side, um, you're, you're very, very welcome. I mean, it's, it's a blessing to have you on here. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, I interview people in all different combat sports um, all over the world. But you don't always get the opportunity to have the people on here that sort of I've personally followed. Um, sometimes I do it in a few, but you know, you're one of those guys. So, you know, that's a blessing. Um, your accomplishments, everything we've talked about, hopefully getting into a few deeper things, as well as a few um, sort of more regular things and mixing it up uh, will be good for people. So it's been a pleasure and it's been an honor. And, uh, you know, the last thing for me to do is, is just to say, once again, a big thank you for, for your time. I know you said that to me, but thank you for taking an hour out of your day um, to sort of share everything you shared. And thank you for being so open about everything because that's the other thing. I mean, you shared some really good stuff from the heart um, and that's the best way. So thank you for all of that, champ. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. It's a lot of fun to sit down and talk about some of these old fights. And, and, and uh, so thank you. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel and there will be more videos coming soon.